It's great to see so many smiling faces here this morning. I think we're lucky it's this week and not last week. I would have been a bit cold standing here last week, so we're lucky. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm John Flynn. I'm the current uh, president of the Brisbane Committee for the Council on Tall Buildings and ha Urban Habitat. And on behalf of our committee and our sponsors for today's event, uh, Project Services, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. Our last breakfast here in this room here, we looked at uh, one central park in Sydney, is that catalyst for urban renewal in, the, uh, in Sydney. And today we're looking at the uh, Gold Coast Cultural Centre as, a, as I guess, as a cultural renewal of, for the Gold Coast. Um, the Gold Coast Cultural Centre competition has been the wings for quite a few years. Planning for the Gold Coast Cultural Heart got underway many years ago. The community support and awareness of this project is growing all the time. The council selected the site of Evandale, which you can see on the screen here, is the, is the, the new home or the expansion of the home for the Gold Coast Cultural Centre. The Gold Coast Arts Centre is there now. It's been there for 25 years and it's growing to, you know, grow, outgrowing the site. And there's a great opportunity, I guess, as a catalyst to combine the renewal of the Gold Coast uh, Cultural Centre and the Commonwealth Games there in 20, 2018. So today we're going to hear about the ideas behind the competition, how the uh, winning entry was selected, and hear from, um, from the winning entry scheme. So for proceeding from the Gold Coast City Council side, we've got Tory Jones, we've got Malcolm Middleton, the State Government Architect, talking about the jury process, and Howard Raggett from ARM Melbourne talking about the design um, outcomes and ideas. I'll formally introduce those speakers just after breakfast, but events like this are not possible without our generous sponsors, and as I mentioned, Project Services are our sponsors today. And um, they go back to the uh, 1859, I guess, when Queensland first separated from, from New South Wales. We had to form our own public service to start design our, our own buildings and maintain our buildings and things. There's a history that goes back there, and the first building I could find was um, the Ipswich Courthouse, in nine, uh, finished in June 1859 as the sort of first building that was, was delivered. It's still there now and it was active as a court right up until 1980, so it's a pretty great legacy. But not only have Project Service delivered those iconic old buildings, they're certainly involved in newer ones like the Karupa Bridge, Suncorp Stadium and the uh, Queensland Cultural Centre. So it's great to have uh, such a long legacy of delivering projects and in urban renewal, I guess, a lot of those projects have involved renewing older parts of Brisbane. So we'd just like to thank Project Services for, for supporting today's breakfast, and Malcolm Middleton will be up later to give the a vote, of, vote of thanks. Format for today is the same as most breakfasts. I'll get to sit down in probably five minutes. We'll um, come back up just after breakfast to introduce. Before we do, we just go through the news of what's been happening on the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat around the world. First important intro, I guess you'll see on your table, there's a flyer there for our symposium on July, September the 1st this year. Um, it's the first event we've tried to coordinate with our Bris Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne committees. So hopefully it'll be a great morning of discussion about what's happening around the world and you know, around Australia in terms of tall buildings. We have a keynote speaker over lunch who's Carol Willis, Willis from the Skyscraper New Museum in New York. And she presented last year at the Shanghai Conference and from what I've heard it was a great presentation. So she's flying out to present that here. And then following that in early October, October the 8th, we've got Emily Fang from Sir Norman Foster's office coming out to talk about the the 12 hectare urban renewal project in Shanghai of the Bund. And those who've been to Shanghai, the Bund is an amazing part of, uh, of Shanghai where, where European history meets Chinese history. So the Foster's office has been working on the refurbishment or the redevelopment of that precinct. So Emily's going to come out and explain what's happening there. As always, you can join the council by uh, signing up online for your $150 US a year. But I did discover this just recently that there is another way to join. If you want to volunteer to become on the Skyscraper Centre editorial board, it means you've got to find we research tall buildings around the world or in Australia. You submit images and drawings to the, uh, to the council. And I think if you do it, you've got to do it so many. But if your first tier is uh, free membership, second tier is uh, attendance at the conference. And then if you produce, send in the most information on a building for the year, you get all expenses trip paid to the conference, wherever it is in the world. This year it's in New York, so that'd be a great opportunity to, to go. But this year, Terry Meyer from uh, Waterloo University won. She submitted 462 buildings to the database this year, so I figure she must have used her students from the university or something to put it together. But anyway, <laughs> she got a free trip to, to New York. But this year there was 479, 4,794 4, 4, 4, new images, two over 2,000 new buildings from 26 countries around the world, and the five top cities were Toronto, New York, Moscow, Chicago, and Chongqing, wherever that is. Um, but it's a great opportunity. If you don't want to pay your $150 US, you can actually start collecting data for the database. Um, 
Just off the news that surprised me was this, that Paris is getting its first high-rise in 42 years. It'll be the third tallest building in Paris. Um, it was rejected previously by the, count, the government, the council there in 2014, but it has now been, a, been approved. It's 180 metres tall, 43 storeys, predominantly residential, and it's designed by uh, Herzog de Miron. And it's obviously the French have a passion with the, the pyramid. It's certainly an unusual shaped building. This, this orientation looks quite, quite fat. The other orientation is very slender, so certainly a striking building on the skyline in uh, Paris very shortly. But in terms of tall buildings for this, this round, I thought we should focus on the Gold Coast and just see what's been happening, happening down there. And as most of us are aware, the, the Gold Coast really suffered under the uh, global financial crisis. But in the last recent year, the last couple of years, the, uh, really following the development of the light rail, there's been a huge influx of um, projects on the Gold Coast. And they're sort of suggesting there's about $6 billion worth of redevelopment poised following that eight kilometres of light rail through the centre of the coast. Most of it's at Broadbeach, but it does spread up and down the, the full length of the, uh, of the train. This one here is, is by um, Hong Kong developer Four Eyes Investments, and they just lodged this DA very recently. It's, they're suggesting it's a $700 million development. The interesting part for me, it's on top of the Isle of Luca Tower. If we all remember that we're growing up, that was probably one of the most iconic high rise on, on the coast for many years, which was obviously demolished a couple of years ago in 2013. But this building is about to, uh, to uh, rise out of that, that site. And the Four Rise ch Chairman's brief was to um, develop a world-class iconic building that would uh, stand out on the Gold Coast skyline. There's some competition down there to stand out, but it is a fairly striking, striking building. Um, so it'll have almost 700 apartments when it's finished. Them all. These two towers are on Albert, Albert Street, they're much smaller, only 35 and 28 storeys, nearly 250 apartments, and that, that sort of Broadbeach area really is going ahead in leaps, leaps and bounds. Another one at Broadbeach, and then obviously at Broadbeach still is the, the um, Jupiter's Casino Hotel extension, which I think is out to tender at the moment, so again another striking building going to appear on the Gold Coast, Gold Coast Highway. Jewel is under construction now, and this is um, developed by um, China's richest man, who owns the Wanda Group. And this is uh, going to have 500 apartments when it's finished and 171 hotel rooms. But it's certainly the first one really to get out of the ground and, and get going. And then the other one obviously is Sunland's uh, dream on the spit, with the three-storey height limit to get four, two 45-storey towers. Again, a very out there design from Zaha Hadid, but I wish to see, see what happens. So it's certainly interesting to see there is a lot of building happening, a lot of building happening in Brisbane, but also a lot of building planned on, on the Gold Coast. And I guess the cultural project about here really fits into that whole crowding a uh, proper, proper heart and cultural centre to the Gold Coast. So that's it for the news today. I'll be back after you've had your breakfast to introduce our three speakers, and um, I'll speak to you shortly. Thank you. So the main event. This morning we've got three speakers. Um, Malcolm Middleton, who we all know as the government architect, will be up first to give a little overview about the, the process that was under, undertaken. And then Tory Jones will uh, run through the competition and some outcomes. And Tory's been living on the Gold Coast for, for 20 years. She's been an operative in the state and local government planning, design and project management circles. Tori spent a decade in Brisbane working on, arts, working on the Arts Queensland Heritage Trail Network, then with the State Library as the manager of the Millennium Library Projects, we all know and love across the river there. She was also involved in the EDGE Digital Cultural Centre and the Asia Pacific Design Library. She returned to the Gold Coast Council in 2011 to lead the conceptual development and running of the international competition to select the uh, designers for the Gold Coast Cultural Centre. So she'll be giving an insight into her involvement and then our third speaker, when I find a bit of paper, is, is what well, was mentioned before is Howard Raggett from ARM. Howard is known around the nation for his innovative design practice and theory. He has played a leading role in many distinctive high profile ARM projects and has won many architectural awards and been a real city shaper as, as part of Melbourne. Key projects include the Shine of Remembrance editions, Hammer Hall, the Melbourne Recital Centre, the RMIT Story Hall, the Perth Arena we've all seen recently in the awards and the National Museum of Australia in Canberra. For Howard presenting on, on the awards. So I'll invite Malcolm up now to uh, introduce and tell us a story about the correct project services. <coughs> no? <laughs> Thanks, Malcolm. 
Yes, thanks, John. It's, it's the Building Industry Engagement Unit of the Department of Housing and Public Works, who are very, uh, through Don Rivers, uh, we're very pleased to uh, take a table here this morning. Uh, so, yeah, changes of changes of names, but they're they're quite important in terms of the symbolic re-engagement, I guess, with the with the building industry through a, an external um, support. But my role here this morning is just to say a few words about uh, competitions. Um, this one in particular, just outline who who the jury were, and then move on to to the main game. Uh, competitions in Australia is a very interesting um, phenomenon that. Australia has not embraced competitions to the degree that you might find uh, in Europe particularly, uh, but nonetheless some of our most high profile projects and uh, iconic places have been delivered through international competition structures. Most would know the city of Canberra of course, a very high profile process at a time when communications for such a, uh, a large-scale competition were, were quite different and, uh, and very difficult for such a, uh, a major uh, undertaking. The Sydney Opera House is, is known to everyone. Parliament House in Canberra, similarly, very high profile outcomes and arguably very good outcomes delivered through a competition process. More recently, uh, here in Brisbane, you may not know that the new ferry terminals that are appearing up and down the river now were the subject of an international design competition run by the Government Architect's Office four years ago after the floods. Uh, and like all competitions, uh, you just don't know what you're going to get, whether you get interest in the competition until you actually get the material. Um, I think uh, the story of those ferry terminals it would be, could be subject to uh, its, its own breakfast. I uh, certainly don't want to go into that now, but there is a high degree of innovation in those projects and I think already you can see a, a high degree of city unification on the river just through the regularity of the colour scheme and the style, uh, I think a very good outcome for, for this city. So in terms of this setting, Gold Coast made a, made a decision to, to run a competition and Tory will give you the detail behind that, I'm not going to go into that. My role was as a reserve juror, which was a privileged role in the sense that I got to sit through all the, all the processes. I couldn't vote, but much of the uh, process that happens um, in these things is to do with the conversations that take place and the culture that develops around the jury. And I'd like to acknowledge sitting at our table is Professor Gordon Holden, that would probably be well known to most of you in the room, uh, is the head of discipline in the School of Architecture at Griffith University uh, and was the competition jury chair for this process. Uh, I was going to uh, just run through who the balance of the jury were because it's an interesting mix of people. You had the Mayor Tom Tate, Deputy Mayor Donna Gates and their role, obvious, uh, obvious interest is, is clear. Professor Michael Sorkin was the international juror, somebody well known to uh, the Gold Coast people. He'd been out a number of times, he knows the Gold Coast. He'd presented at a couple of the early urban design conferences and a very strong personality. And that's part of the issue with competitions. You need the credibility of the jury for the competition itself to attract the best people. With that credibility, you must have certain personalities of which Michael was certainly one and a very strong uh, advocate for uh, particular schemes and, and responses. Professor Helen Armstrong, uh, uh, the Emeritus Professor in Landscape Architecture at QUT, covered the, uh, that landscape component. And then local representatives through Greg Forgan Smith and Destry Puya from the Gold Coast Cultural Centre, along with John Kotsis from QPAC, provided that technical local perspective. And then finally, uh, Professor Geoffrey London, the, at the time, the Victorian government architect and was chairing a major international jury for Flinders Street Station, which was very much in the media around this time. And Geoffrey had done a lot of competition work. I then took the role of reserve juror in case somebody got sick. Nobody got sick. So uh, I just got to sit through the process. But I guess the point I want, really wanted to make more than anything else, that um, you don't really know how the process is going to go until it is revealed what sort of calibre of competition entries you've got. Gordon might say, in fact, he was always in control of this and uh, his very subtle management um, shepherded it through, through to the end. But 
It is actually a very subtle process of allowing the jury individually to express their views. There is not always unanim unanimity at certain parts of the, co of the conversation, but there is a culture that does develop as you narrow down from a, a room full of entries. Competition entries have got to really attract your attention very quickly to get through to a conversation to get through to a shortlist and then there is a much more detailed analysis on a smaller number of, of entries resulting in this case, and Tori will go through this, uh, in a, a selection of three, um, who were then invited to develop their ideas into much greater detail and were paid quite handsomely by competition standards. I think the figure was 200,000, 250? 250,000 each to actually develop their concepts up, which is, which is very generous, but it also was deliberate uh, in terms of being, ensuring that high profile uh, schemes were, were submitted. Iteratively, that competition process took place over several months and from the shortlisting to the final presentation there was a, there was a considerable gap. The jury reconvened several times for that but I can say quite clearly that by the time the end process was reached, the final outcome was unanimous. And that's what you want, I think, in a jury process. You, uh, whilst John would like to have some controversy, and controversy is always good, you do want to think that you've got the best outcome that you can get. And I think the process you're now going to hear about will explain a lot more about that to you. But I certainly commend uh, the competition process, if well run, uh, can really help get great ideas on the table and momentum to see them through. Thanks very much.